Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, where once a week we get together and explore the many ways, sometimes obvious, sometimes a bit more subtle, that weather intertwines itself into our everyday life. I'm your host, Mark Jelinek, and this week we're going to be trying to answer the question, should meteorologists be unseen? And for that matter, should they be even unheard? But before we dive into that, as many of you know, Irma was front and center of my life this week. It's kind of hard to not follow it with everything going on, but was also dealing with the direct impacts where I live. But, you know, the following it stuff, I I struggle with this. And... I think, you know, I guess I want to pass along some advice and just recommendations. Whatever whatever news thing you tend to get fixated on or whatever topic you tend to get fixated on, make sure you take a break. It was interesting. Living outside the U.S. for a while, I learned to be able to more easily turn off kind of everything that was happening in the U.S. news cycle, mostly because it just wasn't in my face all the time. Yeah, I could still get it online, but, you know, wasn't getting local channels or that sort of thing that were just kind of throwing it at you. So I had that benefit that I could more easily disconnect from the story of the day or the big deal of the day or whatever it was. And I have to remind myself to even do that with weather events. And it's tough in a week like this where I kind of need to pay attention, need to know what's going on. But I also don't want to let situational hype, which we're going to discuss a little bit more on the main topic, overly influence both what I'm doing, you know, just living or even in my professional life. I, I mean, I, that was a definite balance that I had to strike this week. But just in general, it's important to find that time where you control the media. You know, Watch a movie or something you pick as opposed to it being thrown at you. you know, make a choice, re- read a book, or, or make a choice as to what you're ingesting. Because when we're on Twitter and Facebook and all these things, you're getting ingested other people's perspective and takes and all that stuff. And that doesn't always necessarily funnel out the same way inside of us. So take some time to do that. Just just a recommendation with how weather intertwined everything was coming at me this week. It was a reminder that it's important to do that. You know, the other thing this week that I'm also getting ready for, and actually was part of my challenge this morning, I got a confirmation or a reminder about a hotel I have coming up this weekend and I realized that I had booked the dates and then the flights were different and I thought I had changed the hotel but I hadn't changed the hotel but it's a weather conference folks so you know you're gonna have a cyclone of meteorologist now I don't know yeah it's not an official name it should be it's what we should be called right something like that you know animals all have their things some are more descriptive than others I, those are always funny looking at I, what I was looking at something it's like a group of giraffes is a tower. Makes makes some sense. Some of them don't always make sense. So another one that's funny to me is cats. No one can seem to make up their mind what a group of cats is called, which also in and of itself makes a lot of sense. But a death of crows, that's still the one that throws me off the most. Uh, you know, it's most birds are just a flock, but different subtypes of birds have some of their own things. I think it's like a, a rafter of turkeys and, and different things. But for now... We're going to have a cyclone of meteorologists descending on Orange County, California for the annual National Weather Association Conference. I'm looking forward to that and getting prepped for that. But of course, in the midst of it, I'm trying to do everything else. And it was just one of those things where, oh yeah, that hotel reservation is off by a day. That's not good. Well, I guess my room would be there and all nice and ready for me. It just would be absent me. All right, let's jump into our main topic. Fundamentally, you know, I talked about unseen, unheard, but I almost feel like saying, should meteorologists just shut up? You know, should we just be some thing that happens, you know, behind the magic wall or magic curtain, if you will, to use a Wizard of Oz since it's weather-related sort of reference? Now, let's talk about why I might even suggest that. Now, clearly this is going to be around Irma because it was very much, like I said, a, a 
real case example, and you don't always get these things. Well, you know, we're all influenced by things every day. This was a case where I definitely got a witness very different opinions on things and different groups, you know, had different opinions and those sort of things. So I wanted to get back to a topic to me that I've sort of been watching for a while. And it's born out of this idea that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, one, people hardly, you know, they got a weather forecast, but they got a very general thing. Might rain today, might, you know, is it going to be rainy, sunny, windy, winter weather, whatever it might be. But for the most part, it's a very broad thing. Uh, you might have gotten a morning and an afternoon, but you got a day's worth of stuff. And part of that was the weather forecasting at that point in time generally could get the ideas right, but we were still improving and improving and improving on our ability to break it down during the course of the day, let's say. But now everywhere you go, we're flooded by it. Here's your hyper-local forecast on the eights right now, now cast, whatever you want to call it. A lot of different names have been thrown around it, but the idea is fundamentally that you're getting weather kind of always thrown at you, uh, you know, up to the minute sort of things. And sometimes we that sort of information is useful, certainly. But sometimes you, you just don't care. But how have meteorologists evolved during that time? So when let, let's, you know, talk about it from a television standpoint. And like I said, back in the day, most people getting forecast when, when the rise of television and and meteorologists on the TV really came about, most people were getting their forecast not from a meteorologist, but somebody presenting that weather information. Now, there were always exceptions if you got it from your official source or let's even say a weather radio. To some extent, that was developed by a meteorologist. But the predominance of weather information being shared were people a little more versed in communicating and a little less versed in the science. Now, that changed. We saw this rise of certifications for meteorologists, where a lot of broadcast meteorologists who hadn't gone to school to be a meteorologist or a weather person, whatever name you want to put around it, all these seals of approval started coming out, right? To show that they had an understanding of not just their ability to communicate with you, but their understanding of what was actually happening with the weather at hand. And that, you know, it created a higher comfort level with people. And I get that. And I think it made a lot of sense. And at the same time, you also saw the rise at a, some meteorology-oriented programs at school, some of the bigger ones, were adding this broadcast element into their programs to give these budding meteorologists a chance to get, you know, what was a blue screen at the time, now it's a green screen, chance to try to communicate, you know, focus on the, the sharing of weather information. But in watching some of those programs, what I still saw was, yes, there was this emphasis on sharing the weather or showing the weather, but there was still a lack of fundamentally communicating. Now, I watch a meteorologist here in Atlanta that I happen to know personally, but his background is in communication. I mean, that's what he went to college for. And I can see differences in what he would say versus watching other meteorologists because you can see sometimes it's very obvious that he's thought about what he's going to say. And other times it's just his natural tendency to be able to communicate certain things and be very effective in that communication. Now, other meteorologists are good at just being on air and being a bubbly personality or whatever it is. And when weather's not critical, you know, that, that also works fine too. But when it comes to communicating weather with meaningful risk associated with it, I think there's still this void. So all these meteorologists are coming out but they don't necessarily have the effective communication skills. And I don't just mean about what you say or how you look in front of the camera, but having the ability to think through the message that's going to be communicated and how effective that is. And is it really conveying to your audience the information at hand? So here we were, and let's just set the table a little bit since we're using Irma as the example. 
it's a day before Irma's going to make impacts in my area. And the local weather service issues a very broad forecast. Now, they're issuing a forecast across the state, did some graphics and some text. And they have these wide areas of certain amounts of rain, certain, certain amounts of winds, both sustained and gust. I mean, that's one of the, the nice things about winds, right? Is generally a gust is kind of almost bringing in that worst case, right? Versus sustained is more real of what you're going to feel the bulk of the time. So it kind of does that automatically. But rain, not so much. You get these broad range, especially when there's more rainfall. So I saw some maps that very broad swaths had four to six inches of rain. Now, for some people, anything over four would be a lot. For some people, four to six in general, it's about the same. But in some areas around like where I am, there is a huge difference between four and six as to how it might imp impact certain people. Not everybody. But that's still kind of a broad category, right? So it's lost some of that granular nature, some of that resolution. Because, you know, a lot of times when it's less than an inch, it's less than a tenth of an inch or a quarter of an inch or half an inch. So there were some of these broad numbers going on. But generally people on the receiving end, based on the feedback I'm getting, tend to fixate on that higher number. So anybody who saw these four to six inch ranges was very fixated on that six inch. Anybody who heard a gust value was very fixated on that. Now, some of it's always going to be the people. But in the coverage I did watch, some of it was in the way it was being communicated. And this was tricky because I was forecasting during this time from, for clients, right, that were going to use this information. But I also took this opportunity with some friends and family and even the apartment complex I live, I was providing the management, you know, a copy of what I was, I, I did a secondary forecast, something a little more, t it had to be a little broader because with most of my clients, I'm, I'm hitting specific topics and very specific issues. So I did a, a broader thing about here's what to expect. But I was also focused on the timing, you know, when would you expect the worst, right? Not just how much was it going to be, but what time period of the day was that going to fall in? When would it even ease up? When might you notice it, things releasing? Now, all of my forecasts that I did, with the exception of a couple phone calls for friends and family, were written text. I did no supporting graphics, no verbal, no video by any means. It was all written text, which is also good and bad, but it, it provides an opportunity to take the emotion out of it. And I do think that it, sometimes that's a good thing, right? And it can be particularly good for people who are not always good at properly gauging how they're presenting information that is of a critical nature. So here we are, all these things took place. And if you take this official forecast, the National Weather Service forecast, and I'm not even talking about all the nuances of individual TV stations or radios or whatever they did, because, you know, literally my wife came out of, of the bathroom on Saturday morning saying they're talking up to six inches of rain. Are we going to get six inches of rain? And I'm like, no, I don't think we are. And here's what we're going to get and a little bit of why. I don't get in that much detail with her because she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't really care all that much. She counts on me to let her know if it's going to be something we need to worry about. And for us, where we are, I knew it wasn't going to be a problem. Yes, we might lose power. Right? That was going to be the big concern. But our structure and most structures for the winds that we were talking about getting were going to be fine. The real risk was going to be with trees and the implications of those trees. So the event unfolds, right? Now, in the post-aftermath, doing all the, you know, what were the totals and everything, most of the rainfall totals, almost all of them, were less than were projected, right? Some exceptions to that, but generally speaking, some were close to what they were projected, and I consider that a win. Some were a little, you know, the, the forecast versus reality probably was amped up a little, a little much, but... When you're talking about needing to do a broad forecast and the fact that there could be a potential for that, we were certainly had the potential, had you know the rain shifted 50 miles one way or another, we could have seen more. So I understand needing to convey that, that projection that it might get as high as. But this gets back to things we've talked about before, of the challenges, right, of communicating what could be your worst case versus the reality. Now, on the wind front, it was interesting because... In a couple of places, the winds actually were higher 
than anticipated. But in many spots, they just never got to the, the levels that were anticipated. Now, all that said, all that said, there were lots of power. There was widespread power issues around Atlanta and around all of my state. So, you know, Atlanta is a city of about 5 million people. I, I don't know what the final numbers were. Some areas more, I saw some counties or so little subdivisions here, you know, in terms of what a state looks like. I, you know, I know not all this makes sense to people around the globe, but anybody that lives in the U.S. knows we have these counties or parishes or whatever you want to call them, depending on what state you're in. But Georgia has a lot of them compared to some other locations. So, you know, some of them are bigger. Some of them might hold a million people, but a lot of them are smaller than that. But around the metro area, a lot of the bigger counties hold roughly a million per people each, let's say. And I saw some counties that supposedly lost up to 50% of the people were without power. And others on, you know, again, depending where you were in the metro area, some were as low as 15 to 20%, and, and even lower in some cases. So it really depended on where you were. And the winds didn't necessarily set up the way they were projected. And there's some neat topographical, and I shouldn't use the word, some interesting topographical scenarios that may have come into play. And I hope someone does some research on it. I wish I had the time to do it because there's a, a I believe there really was an influence given what the topography of Georgia looks like in the way the wind field set up. Topic for another day. But any case, if we look at all that, it just, it wasn't like the pictures right? And to some extent, it certainly wasn't like the words. Now, I watched a meteorologist that I trust and highly respect try to equate the weather impacts and trying to say that the weather forecast was good because of the power outages. And you just can't make that connection. Because I also saw p people that were trying to do the power estimates not properly estimate that. They were talking about, you know, whether it was moderate or low and, and trying to use different categories. And some of them made sense. Some of them did a really pretty good effective job in my mind. Again, in my mind. Okay, this is, we're first talking about my take on it. Some of those people did it did a, a good job at trying to do that. But again, sometimes when you see these swaths and they paint a picture, and in some cases it just didn't amount to that, what was partly interesting is some of the worst power problems were not down where the storm was actually kind of tracking where they thought it was going to be some of the worst. It ended up being worse up near the mountains, down towards parts of the metro Atlanta area. But all that said, so there were good elements of the forecast, but it highlighted some of the problems. One of the things I consistently saw was, you know, there was inconsistency between the official forecast and what some of the broadcast people were saying, but also in that I'm not sure that people, in, in my watching it, trying to, you know, and I do try to separate myself, in my watching it, that people were able to take and say, okay, this is the worst case. Many of us won't experience that. And this is the likely of what most of us should experience. And sometimes that's also hard to communicate. You don't always have the time and the opportunity to do that. But this event was also a bit unusual because usually when, when our area has power outages, and we do, we have these kind of large events, they're usually associated with winter weather. However, every now and then we get these tropical cyclone coming upstream inland far enough that we get them around those but generally speaking it tends to be at a different time of year and even though trees for Atlanta are always the issue always it was different trees because we still got full, full foliage on the trees so it was this deciduous trees with lots of big green leaves on them that were the bigger problem than a lot of times we see in the winter when you know trees don't eat as easily blow around but what blows around the winter is pine trees more or the evergreen trees here which we also have tons of. And the other challenge that came out of this is even though there were some widespread power outages, unlike winter weather, when it might be hard to get around, most people could get in their car and drive somewhere. And if they really needed something, could still get to the store. And the tap water generally worked everywhere. So all this hype that we get around winter weather where people were trying to apply the same standards and go to the store and buying everything out of water and stocking up. Well, if you first of all, you lose power 
you better have stocked up on canned goods, which most people don't do as much in this day and age. They go out and buy steaks and hamburgers and hot dogs and put them in the freezer or the fridge and buy their veggies and everything else and it's all in the fridge. And those are the things that are, if you lose power, those are the things that are going to go. And that's not what people do. And generally, even when we have these events, people don't lose water supply. Winter, it can be different because pipes can freeze, of course. But with all this power outage, most people, still had water and were able to get water. Or if they couldn't, they could easily get to a neighbor or get in their car and go somewhere and get the stuff if they needed to, right? That, that was the difference. So even though power outages were w- widespread, you got to think about what that word means. It's just distributed over a, a wide range. It doesn't mean that they were significant in all those areas. Around me, we had a tree that did go down. We had, I had two in all my walking around during and after the storm, two that I saw that were down. One went over a power line, and a very important power line that supplied a lot of people. Now, fortunately, I didn't lose my power. It did kind of flash a couple times, but it never went out. And the other tree was just, it's still down. It's one that's like, eh, we'll get to that whenever. It wasn't in an important area. And plenty of trees could have come down. And some probably in more wooded areas maybe did come down, although the, the tighter the kind of the forest, the harder it is to expose one tree. But really what happened is winds came from a certain direction and it was trees that had a lot of moisture and that had that setup that were most vulnerable. But again, it wasn't like blanket trees down everywhere. It wasn't like a tornado ripped through it. And it wasn't even like if we really had stronger winds and significantly more trees went down. So for a lot of people, and this is where all this gets to, a lot of people that have been bending my ear for the last few days really felt oversold on this whole event. We didn't get near that much rain. We didn't get near that much wind. Why are the schools still closed? All these things. And there are logical reasons for why the schools are still closed. And if you look at the worst case and how the worst case played out in places, it was probably best that that information was shared. But for them, it was a horrible forecast. So, of course, they blame their meteorologist. And this is where I get to, maybe we should just stop doing forecasts. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have weather forecasts and meteorologists shouldn't be involved, but traditionally our job has been to take what the weather models say and all this weather data that we have available to us that we're getting in real time, even after the models run, translate all that into something useful and meaningful for people. But more and more what we're asked to do is not only translate that into useful weather information and understand the, the nuances of where we are or what where the models fail us and those sort of things and be able to translate that into our statements, but they also want us to do impacts. So now not only should we be have an understanding of the science, which I think more and more people that are involved in communicating that with the public do, we have to be effective communicators in properly being able to communicate the risk from a weather standpoint even, just straight up weather standpoint, of worst case, what the most people will have. And, and of course, you got to deal with the fact that, you know, all these people are, the way the model works, those stations want you to keep watching, right? So they're going to do the things that grab your attention, hence the headlines with certain things and everything else. But even if you step back from the hype, because I'm not sure everybody hypes it, and you, you find the people that are well-grounded. The question is, one, do they understand the science well enough to communicate it? Two, are they truly effective communicators in breaking down the worst case versus the probable? And are they separating that? And is it grounded and well-based? But three, then the impacts. So now they want everybody to be able to say, okay, that's going to translate into exactly this many people losing power. But can you really translate that into exactly where people are going to lose power? So that the message gets more and more complex. So now you really got to ask, do people really care about what the weather forecast is? Or do they really just want to know if they're going to lose power? And should we really be focused on getting better at that? Because I can tell you, like this conference I'm going to, there's going to be a you know panel about communicating. And there's somebody who's made the circuit around a lot of weather events I've been at in the past couple of years, and that's what she does, is trying to help people understand what we're communicating, what people really need to understand. But it's also harder because that means you need to be an expert in yet another thing. So I'm starting to question whether meteorologist should be the one conveying to you what the impacts are, or should there be specialists in these other things. But, you know, here's the harsh reality. What's the likelihood that the station is going to hire somebody who's a power expert, right? We're not going to see those things. 
they're going to expect their weather person to be able to diagnose, okay, this is a, this is a power-oriented issue versus just a straight-up weather issue. And again, as I was issuing these forecasts, I have family members connected to both power and safety. So I had to think about those things, as, even as I was giving them information and forecast. And I did try to, th- to think about those things that highlight what I recognized were the risk. But I also, at the same, tried, same time, tried to keep my expertise into where I knew my limits were. I mean, I could say, this is what the weather's going to expose, trees. And I did focus on that. But I didn't sit there and try to say, and I know that's going to translate into so many people losing power and the distribution of those power outages is going to be X, those sort of things. Because I just don't know enough to do that. So are, have we gotten to a point right, with, with our weather forecasting where people really want to know, uh, am I going to miss this event or that event, those sort of things. And I think sometimes a weather person or meteorologist can, can make that step and make that guess. But are we always the right person? And would we be better off if meteorologists sunk back behind the scenes, right? And, and it became more focused on good communicators and good, effective people that can communicate what the risks are and what the outcomes might be for those that are going to be experiencing it. I don't know. Let me know what you think. What is it about the weather? Gmail.com or, of course, what is it about the weather.com slash contact? Either one of those ways. Because, like I said, I saw the gamut. I saw both the, the good and the bad, and I think there were people that did it effectively. But, man, I, I will tell you, I don't care whether it was I, all, all sorts of people I'm talking to general public, other meteorologists, even students, right? And each had a different perspective depending on what they experienced, of course, and that's always the case. But I can tell you the majority of people were, and I don't want to say angry, but they were frustrated that it seemed to be well beyond what they anticipated it was going to be. And part of that is the challenge of can we as people who are getting weather forecast interpret what four inches of rain really means versus three inches of rain, right? And if you were sitting inside, which is what they recommended, for the most part, unless a tree came down on your house, there's a good chance you hardly noticed it because it wouldn't have felt necessarily that impressive unless you lost power or unless you heard a tree fall. Give me a take on your perspective. I don't know. I'm trying to balance my, my view out as we we understand where the meteorologist fits in the communication cycle. I'd like to think that we're good enough to do all those things. I'm not sure that a lot of us are. And I'm wondering where the right balance is for where we fit in the equation. Now, Irma, oh, just a couple of things with her. So a couple of interesting tidbits. Barbudo was an island that was devastated by Irma. Every single person has been evacuated from that island. First time in 300 years there have not been people living on the island. It's pretty incredible when you think about it. You know, I've also, I did that episode in the past about harnessing the power of hurricanes. If I did my math right, because I did some some quick numbers here, Irma had enough power to have provided energy for, it depends on how you slice it, for everybody on the planet for about a third of the year or about a third of the people for the whole year. It just depends on which way you want to run the math. And it was more than a third. It was probably, it, it didn't get to 50%, but it was pretty significant. Again, harnessing that power, whole different story. But it would be nice if we could, right? Had a couple of interesting questions from, from listeners this week as well as general public. But the most, and again, I, there's no way I could get to them all. We don't have time for that. But probably the most interesting one I heard, and this gets into this, what our main topic was, which is why would two meteorologists at the same station contradict themselves? Now, sometimes you'll hear it when one's out in the field and maybe they're experiencing something and they're, we humans don't always estimate, particularly with wind, what the reality of how high the wind speed is versus what it feels like to us. We're not exactly in tune with that. Yeah, we could say whether it's raining or not. And, and some people, temperature, they can do it, but wind's not our best thing. But 
what about when two people are both in the studio and one is kind of the focal meteorologist and the other's providing some supporting information to the point, and literally I was asked, why, you know, this person said this, that person said that, why would they have done it? And my guess is one person was applying a little more local knowledge and actually providing some of that nuance of trying to communicate effectively a story. Maybe they were saying, here's the reality for most folks, and the other person was being a little bit of the chicken little and saying, but you could see this. And it just didn't, it didn't work. Whatever the story was, it just caused confusion, right? And they were like, I, I had to turn it off. I had to switch sources, which, you know, hopefully they found somebody better. But, you know, that person, that led to them going, what's the update on the forecast to me, right? I don't know. I wish I had an answer for that. Like I said, all sorts of questions about how we communicate it. Why did, why did you guys say this and that? But, you know, those are very specific things. But this other one, it was, a, it was an interesting take, which is it seemed like two people who should have been on the same page were communicating two different stories that weren't well linked. It didn't come across as one person was saying the norm and the other was saying the, the outlier or the extreme. But, all right, a lot of Irma this week. Not so much Irma next week, but still a lot going on in the tropics this year. So all I can say is with all these things, and I mentioned it before, there have been a lot of people that were impacted a lot worse than I was personally with this one or even my family was in Houston with with Harvey. People have died. People have lost everything. So if you have it in your means to provide a little relief, look for an opportunity to do that. Look for an opportunity to help. And let us shine about the best we are in humanity. You know, I was reminded of a book this week that I really liked as a kid called Go Dog Go by, I think it's P.D. Eastman, if I'm remembering the name right. And one of the premises in there is one, the, the, dogs are wearing hats. and Don't get lost in that. It's a kid's book, right? And one dog asks the other dog, do you like my hat? And the other dog doesn't like the hat. And that's kind of the, you know, happens multiple times until in the end, the dog likes the hat. But the point was the exchanges, no matter what, were always civil. And even though the dog didn't like the hat, they were very polite and said, good day. And they both went about their way. And I know we live in a day and age that isn't always civil, but when you get into important topics and you know, people are impacted, take the time and think about it. Share the feedback, share the criticism, share the the good and the bad. It's always going to happen. But recognize that other person's just a person too. And generally speaking, we're all trying to do our best, whether we're meteorologists, whether we're policemen, whether we work for the power company, whether you're the person without power or you're the in-person need of of a police officer. We all go through these phases and we're sitting on different sides. But if we're a little more civil to each other in those exchanges and respect one, one another as people first, just as people first, the outcomes are likely to be better. All right. Let's wrap up and send you on your way. You know the drill in terms of supporting the podcast, RSVP, rate, share, validate, and pledge. Learn more about that at whatisitabouttheweather.com slash support. But until next time, when I will be probably bringing you an episode from Orange County, California, Stone's Throw Away from Disneyland, or at least they'll record it then. Actually, I'd be in transit back about the time it would normally go live or go up on, on the feeds. Until next time, just remember, there's much more to weather than the weather itself. This is two white super production. We're tired of hearing our uncle grovel, so please support him on Patreon dot com slash weather.